Well, today is going to be a nice chapter. It's chapter 16 of my book. It's on the web. Once again, I would appreciate receiving any feedback. I've not really been inundated. I've sort of received three typos. I assume in this 250-page book there's more things that are wrong than just three typos. I mean, I could, of course, be perfect and write perfect prose, but uh, experience shows it's unlikely to, unlikely to have happened. Now, in particular today, this thing you're going to talk, uh, you'll hear today, um, is going to be critical important for your homework, the one that's, uh, I guess, due next Monday, I mean, Monday in 10 days from now, because it'll be about binocular rivalry, which is one big uh, part of what we're talking about today. So you should uh, refer to today's lecture notes, and also there's one additional review paper by Logotitis and uh, Blake that's on the website that you'll need. And you'll also need a, um, stereo color glasses that they're here. Please, uh, so pick up one. Don't, please don't take more, we don't have a lot. And can you please return them once you're done? They're, they're, they're there, because we, you know, those are the only ones we have um, once you're done with the homework. So the idea is they're red, green, now, they're not perfect. The best way to do binocular rivalry is uh, to get two separate images, totally complete images, one into the left and one into the right eye. But unless you have mirror set up at home, the best way to do that is just to have green and red images and green and red glasses. But, of course, those things are not perfect. The, um, the, 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 um, the color spectral resolution is not very good, so some images will leak across to a certain extent to both eyes. But it's, it's enough to, I mean, you, um, you should be able to see the, ba the, uh, the basic phenomena. There you go. <clears throat> okay, so we'll talk uh, today about what I call perceptual stimuli. There's no commonly accepted word, so I just, I just decided to call these perceptual stimuli. And perceptual stimuli um, put to lie the basic notion that most of us have about the relationship between the outer world and the inner, the inner world. The idea that we have is there's an outer world out there, there's some physical stimulus, some event that happens, a photon uh, gets generated, or a sound wave, or a you know, single molecule of odorant floats around, and then your, your sensory apparatus picks that up and translates that into an unambiguous percept. And this is one-to-one uh, bijective um, relationship. Right? There's one stimulus, there's one percept, there's one percept, there's one... So for every stimulus, there's one percept, that you can uniquely assign it to, and for every, to every percept you can assign a unique stimulus. That's sort of what most of us, you know, whether we think about it or not, certainly if we don't think about it, that's what we assume implicitly. Now, we, you've seen already many illusions where that's not the case, so here we're just going to study them as a whole, because they give rise to some of the best experiments that track the footprints of consciousness as, as sort of consciousness steps around in the brain. And so in all these cases, all these perceptual stimuli, we can dissociate, we can manipulate the relationship between what's out there and what's in your head, between physical objective reality and subjective percept, phen phenomenal content, as philosophers would say. So these are different illusions. So some of these illusions are binocular rivalries. I mentioned they're part of the homework. By stable percepts, I'll show you. I mean, we'll show you an example of these. Here you have a case where you have a, 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 a sustained input, you have a constant input very often, yet, yet you can see two different things. So here you have the case where you have one physical input that gives rise to two different percepts. And when you see one and when you see other depends on all sorts of factors that we'll study. Uh, these factors depend, for example, what did you see before? Uh, flash oppression is another case where there's a, a one input, but you see two different percepts. Motion use blindness, I'll show you that again, we saw it in, in the very first lecture. Again, you have, um, you have, well, not a constant input, but you always have uh, the same sort of input there. You have the, you know, the stationary uh, yellow spots, and then you have the moving clouds. Sometimes you see, you know, one thing, sometimes you see the other. So all these stimuli, all these uh, illusions, if you want, these perceptual illusions are characterized by a non-unique, by a non um, by, by very often an absence of a one-to-one -one relationship, that this one-to-one -one relationship that we think holds true for most things in life, certainly in these cases does not hold. Now, this, allow, this allows you to dissociate the input into the system from the percept, and so now you can study systematically in the brain, you can study where are the neurons, where the part, where the neural mechanism that respond to the input, the physical stimulus, 
and where the neural mechanisms that correspond to or that manipulate the subjective percepts. Right, normally, these are, these are very, very, you can't associate them, right? And the normal, when you've got a physical input that always gives rise to the same percept all the time, then it's very difficult to, to understand where, as you move from the, from, the, from the periphery in the photoreceptor to your high-level neurons that generate your consciousness, where are the neurons that are sort of more responsible for coding the input and where are the neurons that code actually for the percept. In these class of stimulus, you, you'll see we can begin to do that because some, you, know, you can dissociate the input from the, the physical input from the phenomenal percept. The classical one is called a NECA cube, although it's not the oldest one. This is called a NECA cube, N-E-C-K-E-R, because the person who first described in the literature was a Swiss mineralogist who was studying minerals. And he looked at this crystal, and then he saw, he could see it, in, and he talked about it. Probably people see, you know, the Greeks, I assume, see, have seen this already. But it was first noticeable by him, and so it's called the Necker cube. You should all be able to see this cube in one of two different orientations, right? Now, uh, there, of course, a very interesting question is, what triggers the transition? You know, if you just look at it. Suddenly, this one for me is very, it's very labile. It sort of it flips back and forth. It, for, for me, it's very easy to get the transition. Sometimes they associate with eye movements, but not always. I don't know what feelings you have. Can you sort of, without trying to move your eyes, of course, it's difficult because you might make small eye movements that, are, that you might not notice. You have the feeling that you can flip between the two without moving your eyes? It's a controversial question going back. There's somebody who wrote a large monograph on it, um, Levet, Velvet, Lefel, the Dutch guy, on to what extent this is under volitional control. And partly that's very difficult because um, you've got a separate volitional control that you might um, exert through small eye movements, for instance, through blinks or something like that, or very small eye movements that might induce changes. From can you, in the absence of any movements, can you, can you trigger change? And that's very, very difficult to get at scientifically. Okay, then here, uh, a, a artists have made, have made use of these for a long time. I think some of the earliest one was in a Roman villa in um, 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 the city that um, was destroyed in what was it, 72 after Christ due to the, next to the, uh, Pompeii, you know, that was destroyed due to, uh, due to the volcano. Some of these have been seen already there. But essentially, most of you should see, for example, this. Right, you can see as a vaser, you can see a silhouette, you know, this is a nose, eyebrow. In fact, this is the silhouette of Francis Crick. Um, his eyebrow, his forehead, right, you can see the head. Uh, here, this is a picture from Dali. It's, well, it's, it's from a, a painting, but then rendered black and white. So here, it's a scale one. If you really look at the detail, you can see the nanny. I think it's supposed to be his nanny and the uh, little boy here, and you can see... Uh, in the painting, this is supposed to be ships. I don't know what's supposed to be here. Or if you just blur your eyes, what do you see? It's very obvious. You can see a face, right? So this is not quite the same, because here you actually have to sort of blur your eyes. I find it different. Well, I actually saw that they were the worst, and then once you pointed out the nanny, then I saw you, 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 you saw You first saw the face there. Yeah. And the, the mouth and the nose as well. Okay, now I can see it in both, yeah. Well, okay, so this one is called the Schrodinger Staircase. You can see it in, you know, one of two orientations. Uh, although there's probably a bias seeing it as a normal staircase going up, because that's what we expect to. But you can also see it more difficult. You can also see the uh, flip the other way. The ceiling. Does anybody see it any other way? Yeah, it's sort of it's inverted, right? It's like this or it's like this. It's more difficult, I think, for two reasons. A, because staircases that we've seen normally, you know, we don't see staircases coming down from the ceiling. And also, there's a powerful bias at work. We uh, always seem to assume that the light source comes from above. And so that bias is the thing. Uh, this one took me a long, long time to see. There's an old woman and a, a young woman. And you can see it? Yeah. It took me a long, long, many, many minutes staring at it to see it. And now I can sort of flip back and forth. This is the same, uh, this is an old man and a young man. I don't really see the young man in here. 
This is a modern version because it was, you know, for gender equality reasons. This is a good one. And here, let's see, these are ambiguous uh, because you're supposed to seem either as sort of oriented in this way, for example, this cloud. This has to do with what psychologists call grouping, grouping principles. These have been studied a lot by psychologists in the 10s and 20s. You might have heard of Gestalt psychology. Well, they study these sort of things. And I think you can see it grouped in this direction, or you can see it grouped in this direction along here. Uh, you can see this grouped in this direction, and sometimes less weak, you can see grouped in this direction. Here, I find this stronger. Right? You can, well, these things you can either sort of see as flock of geese moving horizontally in this direction, you know, where these point in the direction, or you can all see them as moving downward here. Yeah, that's exactly. So the point here is, in all of these cases, nothing changed over the last two minutes on the input, right? Yet you can see different things. Now, interesting is the question, can you perceive two of these uh, percepts at once? Can you at once, and of course, exactly what does it mean at once? You know, you have to define some sort of scale, etc. Can you see, for example, the, two, the silhouette of the two people and the vase at once? Or can you see the, old, you know, the the face here and the nanny and the girl at once, or can you see the old woman and the young lady at once? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's very small. Well, okay, so the question is, I mean, so in this case, I find it difficult to answer because in the NECA cube, I find it easier, and I mean, the, just for the record, whatever you, whatever you perceive is, I'm not going to argue with your perception, if the claim is that you cannot see them at once, but really, if you can see any this form or this form, you never see them at once, and you never see a superposition. You don't see a state in between. You don't see this and then sort of a state that's halfway sort of in between. You only see this form and this form, and you can never see this at the same time both. You can see it where one half of it is, is in one expression. Okay, that's a very good point. Yes, yeah, so what, sometimes you can get incomplete, exactly, where you, where you see sort of this is in one orientation, that's in the different direction, yes. So there, essentially, you don't see it as a single object, you see it as two separate objects, yes. Now, you all, I, I don't have a picture, well, I have it actually somewhere on my laptop, but not in this lecture. Remember those Escher painting? You must have all seen the Escher painting, right? For example, the, the one with all the monks that go up this tower, and they all go upwards, you know, they only go up, which, of course, we know can't be. And so, um, again, that, that um, this illusion breaks if you can look locally at it. But, um, I mean, globally, if you would put it together into smooth, into a continuous percept, it would be this impossible uh, percept of a staircase always going up. Yeah, so that's a true observation. But the, the claim is that if you have a single integrate, that at any given point, so if you just look at here or just look at this, you cannot see them in two orientation at once. Now, um, okay, this is the same, th well, it's a similar version, but it's a dynamic, it's a dynamic bistable percept. So these are all called bistable percepts. And you, you know, there are dozens of books. It's a huge website, um, illusionswork.com, where there are hundreds of these illusions. You can buy lots of books and art, you know, art shops, etc. that have, this is a dynamic one. Uh, did I show this already? Um, lights. So this takes longer one. This has a longer transition. What do you see? Which direction is it rotating? Okay, so A, you, of course, you can focus on any one part, but then you don't really get the perfect. This is called structure for motion. So you can extract out of, you know, it's just two-dimensional on the course on the screen, but you can extract motion. It's called structure for motion. We'll talk about next year in, in vision class. But the way it's constructed, it's perfectly ambiguous. So it, you can either see it move, tumble towards you or roll away from you. And the point is you can only see it in one, this, I think, uh, unless you see sort of one thing here and one thing there. If you just look at the whole thing, you can only see it in one direction. And this, at least for me, has a long transition period. I can see this move for many, many seconds in one direction. This doesn't flip very fast. It seems much slower, at least for me. I don't know how it is for you uh, um, than the NECA cube, for instance. It's this is much more, okay, so you have the same feeling.
Okay, and then, well, just to remind you, this is the newest member of this family. This is the most compelling one because uh, it's not the same. It's not bistable um, because you always see the, the you always see the the clouds, but sometimes you can see the dots and sometimes not. And I find this the most compelling because if you learn to avoid eye movements, sometimes these dots disappear, particularly the upper one. There's an asymmetry between the upper part of the visual field and the lower part. You can see they're gone like for many many seconds. It helps to have a fixation point. Do you all get that? OK. So now some of these are obviously more accessible to scientific manipulation than other ones. So all the bistable ones, the NECA cube, et cetera, it's unclear really what to vary. People have done some studies, no animal studies I know of, some functional imaging studies, but they're very difficult to manipulate in a parametric way. So it means they're much less accessible sort of to serious psychophysical um, and electrophysiological ex exploration. The paradigm that's so far been the most successful is binocular rivalry. So you can experience this yourself. What you should do, it's actually shown here. So you should all do this right now. So you should all take a piece of paper, because it's very striking. It's not the same, but it sort of it get adds it. And just do this. So with one, I put it in front of one eye. And then, re I mean, rest the, um, this piece of this tube inside the knock of your, the knock of your hand here like this and put it in your right eye, if you do this with your left hand, and look with both eyes. And you, you, you'll see a huge hole in your head, in your hand. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so otherwise you have to do, okay, so, so I'm giving you the instructions for right hand. So I assume, like most of you, I am right, like most of you are right, uh, right eye dominant. So if you put it in your right uh, eye and hold it like this with your left eye, Okay, then there's going to be a big hole in your left hand. Now, of course, if you are dominant in the other eye, then you have to reverse it. It works. In fact, it works even better on the non-dominant one. Whoa! Now, there's a big, huge hole. Particularly, it works extremely well against a bright dark uh, background. Against a dark background, it works much less well because then the other, the hand dominates. But against a back, uh, light, um, bright background, it's a huge hole in your head, hand, not your head. I mean, do you all see that? It's quite compelling, isn't it? I beg your pardon? Yeah. But in my eyes, it's certainly strong on the other one. OK, so, so, so um, this is sort of, a, it's, it relates to binocular rivalry, this phenomena. So binocular rivalry is the following that you, and the best way to do it is to do it with mirrors. But as I, get, as I told you in your homework, you'll do it with red, green, anaglyph glasses. The principle is the same. So essentially, you put one image into one eye and a different image into the other eye, and you separate them. You know, all, all, you know best with a divider and using mirrors, but you can also do that with these glasses. Now, of course, in real life, the images you see in your left and your right eye are never exactly identical, right? You can, you know, you can just check that, you know, this image and this image is sure similar, but, you know, the angles are slightly different. And you use that difference between the left and the right image to get depth. That's called um, binocular disparity, and you use it all or most of the time to get uh, a measure of distance, certainly within a couple of uh, meters. But now when, and, and now when you have images that are quite different, that usually you don't get in a, no a normal circumstance, except if, for example, you do this, where now your left eye sees the hand while the right eye sees something totally different, under those conditions, then what does the brain do? So in other words, if you put two images into the two eyes in corresponding locations, well, in principle, you could imagine that the brain does some sort of superposition. You get some sort of amalgamation. You get the left image superimposed on the right image. And sometimes you can see that, actually. But in general, certainly if you do your experiment correctly, what you see is that the brain doesn't like that. There are these two input now, and they rival for perceptual dominance. They compete against each other. And your brain resolves it, and it does it independently of you. You can sort of be the observer, and you can observe yourself seeing different things. The, the, the um, competition is resolved in favor of one object for three, four, five, six seconds, and then you get a transition, and then you see the other object. So for example, if I put horizontal gratings into my right eye, 
and vertical gratings into my left eye, I don't, I mean, for, for very brief time, I might see a checker, uh, um, checkerboard, you know, sort of superposition of the two. But typically what, what you'll see is for one or two, uh, it'll take some time to set in, and then you'll just see the right, the, the, the horizontal uh, uh, gratings. And then you might see this for three, four, five seconds, and then something happens, you move your eyes, or something changes in your brain, and you see a transition period where you might see what's called piecemeal rivalry, where up here it might still be horizontal, but down here it's already vertical. Sometimes you can see sort of a wave moving. It's like a wave that moves across your visual field that, you know, in front of the wave it's the old percept, the, the horizontal, and behind the wave it's a new percept, the, the vertical. And then after this is over, you only see the vertical ones. And then it flips again three, four seconds. Sometime later it flips back and goes to this. And this is indefinite. It goes from one to the other with these transition periods. And then we ask you to plot those. In fact, we'll ask you to plot the distribution times of those because there's a, um, the, the bottom line is that the individual duration of this is stochastic. It's a stochastic variable. So once it might be three seconds, the next time it might be five uh, seconds. And they're also independent of each other. So it's an independent stochastic process. But um, there's a great deal of regularity in this, uh, um, in this stochastic process. Now, the great thing about this, like, like all the other uh, stimuli, perceptual stimuli, you can use this now to track the footprints of consciousness. Because you can ask, OK, so in your right, the right eye only ever sees the horizontal stimuli. OK, so clearly in the left eye only sees the vertical. So clearly in the right eye, because I know the direct connection between the eyes and optically they're isolated, in the right eye, I'm only going to see ever neurons that respond to, to, to this grating. Okay, so I can ask now, well, if I go to higher stages like LGN or V1, at what stage will I see neurons that begin to respond to the, to the, to the stimulus that I actually don't see? Okay, because at the high stages, wherever my NCC is, I'm going to only see neurons that fire, or at least the simplest assumption is that when your NCC is, I'm only going to see neurons that say, if I currently see this, well, only neurons that correspond to this will be on. And the neurons, um, you know, um, and the NCC will, does not have access to the neurons that represent this because I don't see that. All right, so I can, I can ask the question, where are the neuron populations that switch with my percept? Right? Because those are potential candidates for, for being the ones that actually give rise to this percept, that not only correlate with the conscious percept, but that give rise to the conscious percept. This has been an enormous productive research program, still ongoing, it's very much ongoing. It started, in fact, here 12, 13, 14 years ago with John Allman, who was the first person who tried to do this in a monkey. The, I mean, the psychophysics goes back to at least uh, Helmholtz. But the idea of doing it monkey and then recording, that's a relative new one. And the person who's really done more than anybody else to advance this is Nikos Logotitis and David Leopold, who we're currently interviewing and considering making an offer here to do, to come here to Caltech. <clears throat> okay, so let me tell you about these studies. These are sort of classic studies now, um, although they're only sort of less than 10 years old. So they recorded, this is a monkey brain, uh, primary visual cortex here, the front of the brain, and um, remember the, uh, the ventral pathway that originates in V1 then moves down here to the uh, infer inferior temporal cortex, and so this correspond in humans would be the fusiform gyrus. And here you, along here, you find neurons that respond ever and ever more selective to things like faces and, and colors and things like that. And they record in the most forward part of this part of the brain, anterior medial temporal sulcus. Just, okay, the most forward part of infratemporal cortex. Because they know them, they know, and we, we know from experience from lots of other studies, here you find neurons that are very selective to individual things. Like they might fire a face, or they might fire to a specific face, or they fire to basketball, or they fire to rather weird things that it's difficult to predict ahead of time. So this is the, um, <clears throat> let me tell you about the experiment. The experiments are a little bit tricky. Partly they're tricky for a, for a conceptual reason. They're tricky because if it's true that you could, you see, if I just show you this and I ask you what you see, assuming you're not lying, okay, and I'm assuming the monkeys aren't lying, you all see what I'm seeing a laser pointer. Okay, so I, in other words, I know what you're going to tell me ahead of time. Now, in binocular rivalry, that's not the case, right? Because there are two things, let's see in the simple experiments, the horizontal and vertical, and I don't know what you're actually seeing, right? I, kn I know your input is this and this, but whether you're seeing this or this, I, cannot I have no way of knowing from the outside. It happens in the privacy of your own head, and only you know. However, as I mentioned, there are phenomenal laws. For example, I know that if I do this many times, there's some statistical distribution. I know that they're statistically independent. 
I know what happens if I make the image in one eye brighter. I know what, how these uh, distributions will shift. I can cheat sometimes, and instead of putting these images on, I put actually identical images on, and left and right. If I do this carefully, you won't know. I mean, the hum if I do this carefully, even in humans, you won't know. Right? Because if I now put, bo if the image is identical in left and right, I know exactly how you're supposed to answer, because then you can only report uh, a horizontal, because the horizontal is the only thing that's present. So in a monkey, of course, the situation is much more difficult, because the monkey can't directly tell me that he doesn't talk, so I have to train the monkey, but the monkeys are just like humans. They are very, very clever and very adept, and they're lazy fundamentally. And they'll use any and all tricks they can to get by to get that orange juice or, or fruit juice. So, and 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 every physiologist can tell you stories. You know how they how they got fooled by the monkey. How the, they thought the monkey did some experiment, but actually the monkey, for example, heard every time this one stimulus on. You know the, the you know somehow there was a mechanics, and the mechanics generated a noise. And so it turns out the monkey only responded to the noise because that was much easier or things like that. So you have to be very, very careful. But the point is you can train monkeys just as you can do typical you know, subjects in these experiments. And then, not too surprising to biologists, the monkeys behave very similar to the, to, and to the undergraduate subjects. In other words, they have, they have the same distribution and they have, you know, the, the same, it's, it's more or less the same visual system. As I've been a pain to stress, the visual system of, hu of humans is similar to the visual system of, um, of monkeys. Not identical, but very similar. So now, and now they train them to do the following. They train them, they put them in a chair, and they, the, the monkey could push two, uh, one of two buttons, uh, one of two levers. So for example, they train them every time when, he, when it saw um, the sunburst pattern to press the right lever, and every time it only saw the butterfly to push the left lever. And when it saw both, for example, an optical superposition of both, where, you know, where logotetes just put them both together, or when, you know, you cut out half of one and half of the other and put them together, the monkey was trained not to push anything. So the monkey was trained only to respond with the right lever when he only saw the sunburst pattern and to respond, pull the left lever only when it saw the butterfly. Okay, so that's like a human telling you, you know, yes, I see the butterfly, I see the, I see the, the sunburst pattern. So now, um, here you have sort of, um, what is this? This is um, 25 seconds here. So this is one cell, this is a different cell. When it's gray, the monkey is actually experienced binocular rivalry. So here, in this left eye, is the sunburst pattern. The right eye is the uh, butterfly. Here, it's a superposition of both. No, sorry. Here, it's just, uh, it's just a butterfly. Here, it's a superposition of the butterfly and the, um, and the uh, sunburst pattern. So here, again, these are these trick, trick uh, these catch trials that Logotetus puts in to make sure the monkey isn't cheating, because here you know the monkey has to pull the lever for the butterfly, because only the butterfly is present. Here the monkey has been trained not to push anything, because it's a superposition of both. Here you don't know what the monkey is going to do, because you truly cannot look inside his, in his head. So the upshot of this particular cell is that every time, let me see, that uh, there's a strong correlation between, so this is uh, one particular trial, these are spikes for one particular trial, this is averaged here, and this is the behavior of the monkey. So right was, um, right was when the monkey saw, he can see, right is when the monkey sees the butterfly. So here, every time this, there's a strong correlation between the strength of the cell firing and the fact that he pushes the right button, the right lever, indicating he sees the, sun, the butterfly. Right, so here, um, strong cell firing, the cell, and the monkey tells you I'm seeing the butterfly. Here the cell stops firing, more or less, not totally, but more or less, and the monkey tells you I'm seeing the, the sunburst pattern. Here it starts up again, and here of course, because there's only the butterfly present, the monkey un not unexpectedly pulls the lever. But again, there's this tight relationship between the, the single cell and the behavior, the single, the firing find behavior of the single cell and the behavior of the animal. And you can make this mathematically accurate. You can, you can do, uh, for example, information theoretic calculus. You can, you can put in this, uh, into the standard information theoretic machinery and predict with what probability am I going to predict uh, that the monkey is going to say right lever or left lever. Here's another case, a different cell, also an infratemporal cortex. Here's just a sunburst pattern. Here's a superposition of sunburst pattern and uh, young orangutan face. Here's tr a true binocular rivalry. Here again, it's just, a, you know, um, there's only the orangutan face up or only the sunburst pattern face. And here the relationship is between, 
uh, I guess between the uh, the face, yeah, it's between the face and the. Okay, so here every time the monkey pulled the right lever, which again is the um, is the face, left lever is always a, the sunburst pattern. The monkey, the cell responded. So there's a correlation. So here the cell doesn't fire very strongly. There's always some background firing going on. Remember, this is half a minute. There's some background firing going on, and the, the monkey tells you I'm seeing the sunburst pattern. Here there's a very strong firing going on. And then the monkey tells you it's seeing, um, uh, it's seeing the, uh, the face. And here again, the cell fires, not completely, but intermittently. And the cell, um, and the monkey tells you it's seeing that face. Now you can see it's not perfect. This is not a machine, right? These are neurons, and nobody's claiming that the individual neurons that can that that exactly mimic behavior. So you can see these facts here that you know the cell for some reason nobody knows sort of stopped firing, and here of course it fires a little bit all the time, but nonetheless there's a very very strong relationship from a 90 to, from over 90 percent of the cells you can read out with very high fidelity the behavior of the animal. You can predict the behavior of the animal by looking at these cells here. Of course, these cells are very far away from motor cells. Because you could say trivially, well, if I record from a motor neuron that, you know, that controls my right, uh, the monkey's right arm, and I uh, you know, record from another neuron that controls the left arm, then of course, trivially, I can predict the behavior of the animal. But these are very far away. They're in the purely visual uh, part of the brain. You can do control experiments to show that there's nothing to do with the, with the, sort of the motor behavior by itself. So here the claim is really you're tapping into percept. You're tapping into the, the, pers the monkey's percept. These, some of these, I mean, so 90% of the cells correlate. So, of course, these cells are likely to do a plurality of different jobs. Uh, you know, rivalry is a complicated phenomena. For example, there's always, a, you know, every time you're in rivalry, you see one percept. There's always some time later you see the other percept. So some neurons have to be involved in doing that. If you look at the, if you look at the different neurons, you get a catalog. Some, for example, here they fire quite regularly. Some neurons fire at five to six uh, hertz, ceterism. You can see it very dominant. Some respond very sluggish. Some respond very sustained. This entire menagerie, this entire zoo of different responses. And right now we have no idea what, what, what the function of all these neurons is. Here's another case. This is a, this is a related phenomenon, closely related, albeit not identical, called flash suppression. So in flash suppression, you do the following. You put one image into one eye. Let's say the laser pointer is into my right eye. And you look at it for a second. And then you put a second image. Uh, let's see. This elastic band, this elastic, into my left eye. Okay, so this is on, you flash this on in my, in my right eye for a second, I see it. Then you flash on this into my left eye. If you do things properly, this news input will perceptually suppress the old one. So you, this will just be gone from sight. You can see it here. You put, this is left eye, right eye, nothing in the left eye, and the right eye is the face of the young orangutan. You flash on a zero millisecond this one, and the monkey will always see this one, or you also. I mean, this is very reliable. So this is the advantage of binocular rivalry experimentally. It's much more controllable. In rivalry, you've got this internal thing that tr triggers these transitions. It's internal to your head. It's very difficult to exactly control it. Here, it's always controlled by the external stimuli. Whenever you flash on this uh, other stimulus, this new stimulus for a short time, half a second or a second, was perceptually suppressed this. Very reliable. To so look at the behavior of this cell, again, it's in, in, in close to the infratemporal cortex, superior temporal sulcus. The neuron, this is a neuron that happens to like, for whatever reason, this picture of this young orangutan. It fires strongly to it, in a sustained manner. You flash on this new image, and then 70 milliseconds later, boom, the cell goes to zero. I mean, we're not talking about 10% modulation here. We just, go, you know, the cell just totally goes to zero, shuts off. Although its preferred stimulus is still present. Now, and, and, and here's the opposite. You do exactly the opposite. Here is that stimulus that over here suppressed it, but by itself, the neuron doesn't respond to that stimulus. Then you, you add this new one. This new stimulus suppresses that one, and the monkey sees this, and the cell 60, 70, 80 milliseconds follows. Very reliable. So the point is that this physical setup and this physical setup is exactly the same. Right? In both cases, in the left input, I of this, and the right I of this. Yet here, the cell doesn't fire at all totally zero. Here the cell fires very strongly, and of course, here the monkey doesn't have any visual sensation 
of the orangutan, while here the monkey sees the orangutan. At least that's what we believe from its behavior. You know, nobody asked the monkey directly. So this is really a very, very nice example. And the, again, the majority of cells in this part of the brain respond like this. They, do, they follow the percept, and they do, not, uh, they do not fire to the perceptual suppressed stimuli. Is this the same Yeah, this is one of the same cell, yeah. It's not the same cell as the cell before. I mean, it's not the same, you know, this is one cell, this is one cell, and that's the third cell. <coughs> the slightly different studies. This is actually rivalry. Yeah, it's the same cell. Oh yeah, otherwise it... So this is really, uh, to my mind, some of the best evidence that these new, that the best sort of scientific evidence we have right now for neurons that could be quite close to the neural correlate of consciousness. There are probably many other cells here involved that do the same behavior that involved in switching and in expressing a memory and all sorts of other things, so it could, it's probably likely to be a subset of these neurons. Now, of course, all of this is correlation. All of this is correlation. And ultimately, you want, in neuroscience, we have to, um, to, go from a me, to go away from being a mere observational science to, a, to, um, to something when we can talk about causation. Now, there are many sciences when we can't do that. Like in astrophysics, we can't go from correlation to causation, right? Clearly, we can't cause you know, stars to disappear, to appear, or supernova to happen, at least not yet. But there, at least, we have very quantitative theories that can sort of predict with high degree of accuracy, you know, the evolution of stars and where they are along the hertzsprung russell diagram and all of those things. Now, of course, we're very, very, very far away from that in neurobiology. So at least what we want, if we can't do this pred prediction, at least we want to be able to go to causation. Now, that's not impossible. For instance, there's a type of operation that people do since um, Oswald, not Spengler, but something like this in, in Germany did this first, and then in this country, most popular is um, Penfield, in, or actually in Canada, in Montreal. So what you do during certain types of brain operations, you go and um, you go and um, and take out a part of the brain because it gives rise to epileptic seizure or because of a tumor, and then very often because you want to be sure you, you're not taking out, let's say, language cortex, you're not taking out motor cortex, what you do, you stimulate the brain. And Penfield did this and developed this in art form and did this for a couple of thousand patients, literally. And um, uh, we, we know already from, the, from the, uh, the Bill Newsom experiments, of course, that, for example, if you have this balanced situation, remember in, New, in, in, in Newsom, you had this, this, this cloud of dots that could move in one or the other direction, and you inject current, and you have columns, right? In columns in MT, the fact that so you have a whole bunch of neurons that only code for motion in one direction, and ne next to it, you have neurons that only code for motion in the other direction. So now, if the same exists in, in infratemporal cortex, and there's some evidence for that, Let's say there's clusters for faces, and there's some good evidence for that. So let's say over here you have a whole bunch of neurons that code for faces. And then somewhere else there's a whole bunch of neurons that code, let's say, for more abstract forms, like these sunburst patterns. What you could imagine, that you have a situation like this, which inherently is totally symmetric, like, or in rivalry, where you can see either one or the other. And now if I inject current into the patch of neurons that all code for faces, Maybe I can get enough of these neurons, for example, if I can get enough of this neuron in its bodies, I might be able to systematically shift the percept of the animal. Right? And that, that would be a first decisive step to go in a way to moving towards ca uh, causation. Not just, okay, this correlates, but actually, it doesn't only correlate, it's actually, if I, you know, if I inject current, I can, I can write in a percept, right? I mean, that, so it's a bit like matrix, so matrix reloaded. In fact, I'm on this joint grant with the DARPA grant with, uh, with uh, people at, uh, at MIT, Jim DeCarlo, where we're trying to do something like that in a much simpler case of uh, object recognition in monkey IT. But the idea is that we not only read out, but we write in, right? This is all read out. But in principle, you should be able to write in. And as I mentioned to you from clinical experiments, we know we can do that in, in, some sh in humans under pathological conditions, right? These are epileptic patients, and when you stimulate parts of the brain, you can stimulate, as I mentioned before, you can stimulate these phosphenes. If you do it in V1 and people are blind, you can get these sort of flashes of light. So the question is, what, you know, in a, in a monkey, um, this might be a possible experiment that you can do, although it really works only if you have clustering, right? If you don't have clustering, if the neurons are arranged randomly, then it's not going to work. So that's one step, for example, towards um, causation. Of course, you can either do viral experiments, but they're not, right now, we, we don't have the knowledge, the wherewithal to do this in monkeys. Right? Because ultimately, for example, if you identify there's a subset of neurons here that are involved, 
you know something about where they where they sit. Let's say they all sit in layer six, and then you can genetically characterize them by getting a protein that's only expressed in them. Then you can transiently inactivate them using sort of like a second or third generation molecular knockout. Then you can um, then you can also interfere with the system very delicately, very deliberately, very transiently. And all those experiments are going to happen in the future. Um, so Logotetis and his people, there's a whole number of studies by him, they did this sort of uh, uh, rivaling flash depression in different cortical areas. They tried it in V1, V4, MT, and then what I just showed you was down here, infratemporal cortex. And here, this shows you the percentage of neurons that follow the percept. So by the time you get to this high-level part of the brain, the vast majority of neurons follow the percept. And, interestingly, there are no neurons that represent these suppressed stimuli. So if you believe in Freud, you can say there's no evidence for Freudian, remember the unconscious and all of that? Well, there's no evidence for Freudian unconscious in this part of the brain. Right? Because you could say, I mean, you could, you know, you could put a Freudian spin on this. You could say, well, there are two stimuli and you suppress one actively. I mean, that's what you're doing. So then you can say, well, where in the brain is, is, is that suppressed stimulus present? It has to be present because you, after a while, you know, the other stimulus sort of comes back again. There has to be some memory in, in the system. So somewhere you have to have, there has to be a representation for the suppressed stimulus. And if you want, you can think of it like the Freudian unconscious. Well, it, it ain't here. Because here the neurons don't respond if the stimulus is suppressed. In V1, there's now recent experiments you can show, very beautiful. Uh, there's a very small fraction of neurons, much less than in this old diagram. It's a very small fraction of neurons that, that is weakly influenced by the percept. The vast majority of neurons in V1 fire to the whether or not the stimulus is perceptually dominant. So in other words, whether, whether or not the monkey saw, let's say, the sunburst pattern or saw the orangutan phase, it didn't matter at all in, IT, in, in infratemporal cortex. The neurons kept on firing, more or less undiminished. There was, for some neurons, a small modulation. Um, so so the, remar the remarkable thing is you can have literally a million neurons firing away in V1, yet you don't perceive it. So that, that's very interesting because A, it, it tells you that not any cortical activity gives rise to consciousness. Because you could say, well, maybe, you know, one explanation is there's all sorts of subcortical stuff going on, but when there are lots of neurons that fire in my brain, in cortex proper, that's got to be consciously represented. Well, in this case, we know it's not the case. There are many neurons that fire in V1, but they might fire to the perceptual, sub or they do fire to the perceptual stimulus, to the suppressed stimulus. And that's, of course, what, what uh, Francis Crick and I postulated when we talked about not in V1. So the, I like this, of course, among others, because it very strongly supports uh, sort of our conjecture that you're not conscious in V1, that V1 is necessary for most normal forms of seeing, but that's not where, where consciousness is generated. And then you go uh, in intermediate areas between V1, V2, and these high-level areas, and you see some intermediate change. So here you have like 25 or 30 percent of the neurons that follow the percept. And interestingly, in both areas, you've got quite a number of neurons that only fire when, when their favorite stimulus is suppressed. So let's see, in MT, they did it, uh, they did the study with using moving gratings, when you have two moving gratings and you see one on the other. And there they find many neurons that they fire only, so let's say a neuron fires to, the, uh, to a mo stimulus moving upward. Well, if the animal sees the stimulus moving upward, the neuron won't fire. If the animal doesn't see the stimulus moving upward, but it suppresses it, then the neuron fires. So there are neurons that nobody knows why that, st that strongly respond in an anti-correlated manner. No. Um, yeah, we don't know anything about the cell type, so this is just a cautionary note. So these are some of the neurons that project from that part of the brain that Logotetis was recalling from, infratemporal cortex here, that project to the front of the brain. So again, I mean, it's certainly Crick and I think that these neurons are going to be key involved in, in generating consciousness, since one of the functions of consciousness is to generate is to provide a summary of, of your current percept and send it off to the planning centers. And there are many, this is just one of the catalogs of all the different cell types. These are distinct cell types uh, as defined by anatomy that sit in this part of the brain. And um, as I mentioned, there are different cell types. Physiologically, these neurons behave in a very different way. Some fire in this very chopped theta, you know, this os oscillatory manner. Some fire drrr, maintain sort of fun fire sort of in this much more um, sustained as a transient manner. Some are delayed, some are not. 
So, you know, as we begin to dissect the circuits, we'll realize there are all these auxiliary neurons, the neurons that are involved in the memory, and neurons that are in involved in the, in the encoding of the percept. There's some neurons that are going to be involved in the coding of the, in the suppression of the other percept. It's going to be a very complicated system. And, uh, again, we have to use these uh, uh, perturbation approaches. Well, for example, we inactivate some of these cells, either conventionally by just going inside the brain and, and you know, dumping some neurotransmitter, some pharmacological poison or something that turns off these neurons, or more cleverly, we want to do it genetically where we can target those neurons and sort of switch them genetically, turn them on and off by infecting the animal with a virus or something. Or we could do this in a mouse and use it in a transgenic mouse. All sorts of different possibilities. Yes? Uh, how, how, how do we what? How do we get? Oh, yeah, so, so there what you do essentially blindly, well, all you know is a part of the brain, so then you essentially, you, you lower your electrode and you, you uh, listen to it till you have a neuron sort of that responds, for example, you show different faces or something, till you have a neuron that sort of, drrr, drrr, when you show a face that sort of nicely responds. Okay, so, so there are techniques for doing that. So you can, for example, plot the, um, the action potential. How often does it fire? And if it's a single neuron, if it fired one spike, it's not likely, it's extremely unlikely to fire for the next two or three or four seconds. That's, for example, uh, one way. You can also look at the, actually, the shape of the individual action potential. And from that, you can make some determination whether it's generated by one neuron or by uh, um, several neurons. The trouble is you do, this, you do this in a totally blind manner right now. So you're lowering your electrode. Very often you don't even know are you in deep layers or in superficial layers. Sometimes you know, and you have no idea what neuron you're recording from. I mean, it's like doing molecular biology and saying, well, I don't know, there are some neurons, you know, there's some proteins there. I don't know what they are. They're just proteins, you know, and I'm just manipulating these proteins. That's the state, current, the state, it's a scandal. It's the current state of electrophysiology in these animals. Now, in, in um, uh, for example, in, you know, if you record from, well, I guess in your case, in, in, from locus, right, there you do know to a certain extent, at least in some part when you're recording from, you have a much better idea what neon you're recording from. But here, you've got to remember they're per millimeter, so this is roughly two millimeters from here to here. So, you know, in, uh, in let's see, uh, you know, this chunk here, they're on the order of 100,000 neurons. You know, so it's a big problem. Sometimes, on some days, you know, I just figure we will never understand it, but we will. So let me finish off telling you a similar study that we do in humans. This is now our own work that we do in humans. Well, we use these sorts of stimuli. So these are just the stimuli we use, colorful images. So this is done in collaboration. Okay, the, the work was done by Gabriel Kaiman, who got the um, Clauser Prize for this, of the best PhD at Caltech last year. Um, and it was done uh, in, at the clinic in downtown LA here uh, with a, neuros a PhD, MD PhD person, a neurosurgeon Isaac Fried. And um, we are recording, we, there's a very, very rare opportunity that in fact now up to three different groups at Caltech are taking advantage of this, Aaron Schumann's lab and uh, also Richard Anderson. They're doing it with hunting, we're doing it with UCLA. Where essentially you have patients who have epileptic seizures and they can't control the epileptic seizure anymore with pharmacological intervention. So the drugs are inefficient or they become inefficient. They adapt to them. And then one of the uh, options is, it's actually a very successful option, is brain surgery, where you go inside the brain and you take out surgically, you cut out or coagulate uh, the part of the brain that gives rise to the epileptic seizure. And it's brain surgery. So you don't want to do this at home, but it's, it's rather successful in the sense that many, many of these patients go, most of the patients have significant improvement, and some patients, a significant number, they won't have any seizure at all anymore. In most patients, it's significantly improved. And a small fraction of the patient doesn't make a difference, and that's probably when you actually didn't get the right foci. Oops. Well, I mean, I don't want to make fun of it. It's because the trouble is, that's not why I'm coming to it, because very often the brain looks normal. So in some patients, you can, with the EEG, and based on the symptoms, you know, we, 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 you know if you observe these patients, um, you know, um, that, okay, so epileptic seizure is a very diverse phenomenon. There's very different etiology, different origins, different genetics, different type, you know, depending where the seizure is, you get very different symptoms. You know, some, some, some people have aura, some have don't. So all of that, if you're a doctor and you see these patients a lot, can tell you which part of the brain, is it left or right, or, you know, is it frontal or, or temporal, it originates. In many people, and then if you use those sort of symptoms together with um, uh, X-ray or MR and EG, 
most of these patients today you can locate where the seizure is and in the MR the brain that location looks a little bit abnormal and then you can just directly target and take that out. You take out for example very often the hippocampus sort of you know take out a little piece of brain tissue like this and you remove it, just remove it altogether and you close the brain up and the patient goes home and it's relatively normal. It's amazing if you talk with a neurosurgeon what sort of um, with what sort of nonchalance, what sort of relationship they have to brain. I mean, they go in there with hands, they scoop it and move it up and move it down. And, you know, this is somebody's brain they're in. They just have a very different relationship. Anyhow, now in some subset of patients, that's not the case. So unfortunately, from the outside, even with the EG, you don't know whether the, uh, the seizure originated in the left or the right brain. And if you look at the MRI, it looks relatively normal. So then what you do, you implant, you literally implant electrodes into the patient's head. So now you put up to 12 of these macropobes, so here you can see one in the hippocampus, which very often is where seizure originates. For some reason, this is part of the brain that's very, pro very much prone to, to, to seizure. In fact, HM, um, no, we haven't talked about that yet. Um, and so they developed this procedure. It's now done at many, many universities around the world. Where you monitor, you put in so-called depth, they're different electrodes. And so if you talk to doctors, one, for example, is that doctors do, they put in just grid electrodes, they, they just sort of shove them under the skull and they sit on top of the brain. Then these are more invasive, but you sometimes you need them if you really want to pinpoint where you actually go inside the brain. And so these are like uh, 1.2 millimeter thick in diameter and you, uh, you slowly push them in. And then you, you put 10, 8, 10, 12 of them in, you seal them up, and then the patient lives now on the ward for three days, four days, five days a week until, and he's monitored 24-7, until the patient has a couple of seizures, and then because you monitor the brain signal, you can now sort of pinpoint, you can essentially do triangulation, and you can now recover where the, where the seizure originates. And then you deplant the electrodes, and then a couple of days later you go in, another operation, you take out that part of the brain. And that's considered, I mean, it's invasive surgery, but it's quite successful. And the, the mortality, I mean, today the mortality in any of these brain operations is, uh, you know, it's probably less than, a, it's around maybe a, a tenth of a percent or something like that, or, I mean, um, immortality, of course, there are other things like bleeding is the biggest problem, that's probably roughly a percent. Uh, now, of course, you know, when, when, you are, when you're normal, you don't want to have this done, but when you are, um, uh, you know, a person who has three, four, five seizures a day, you can't drive, you can't really hold down a job, then this makes a huge difference. Now, what they did at UCLA, they hollowed out this volume here, and they added then these microwires, platinum iridium microwires. So now, essentially, you can do what you do routinely in an animal, but you can do it in a, in a conscious person. You can record from their brain. You can record individual nerve cells. So Gabriel showed this here. But this is a cell in, um, this is the, the electrical signal, and this is the visual stimulus. I mean, it looks no different from a... You can see when this was done. Uh, this was done during the election campaign. Uh, it looks no different than what it would look from an animal. Um, so the, this just shows one cell. This is time scale from 0 to 1 second. The stimulus, uh, those images were added at 0 and were removed at 1. So they're exactly 1 second on. And here we show the time, bef 1 second before and 1 second after. The horizontal dashed line is the average firing rate. So this neuron, on average, fired 3.5 spikes per second. And uh, these are different categories of input we showed, and this neuron responds to either face drawings, like um, uh, Batman there you saw, or Clinton or something, or famous people, like, for example, uh, we, in that, as you saw in that, cli in that cli uh, clip, we showed um, uh, pictures of Bush and of Al Gore. Now, uh, <laughs> This picture, just like the American electorate, this neuron, just like the American electorate, was unable to decide statistically whether it preferred Gore or Bush. <laughs> Although, let it be known, it did fire a few more spikes to Gore than to Bush. <laughs> but not statistically more. Because um, it is a different question. Remember that cell I showed in the very first, slide, in the very first lecture, the Clinton cell? Well, that comes from here. Because some cells actually, a very rare number of cells, do respond to one picture much, much stronger than to any other. We have like 12 of those neurons now. So the, the Clinton picture I showed you, 
um, responds to three different pictures of Clinton, you know, a line drawing of Clinton, a photograph, a presidential portrait of him, and Clinton with Chelsea and somebody else. And these, you know, Clinton physically looks, you know, very different, okay, one in color, one in black and white, but yet the neuron still responds to it. So some of those neurons respond very, very specifically. Some, or many more, are more broadly, like these cells seem to respond to any famous person or to a face drawing of a famous person. It doesn't respond to unknown people. So here we have unknown actors displaying various emotions like happiness and sadness and anger. It doesn't respond to them. Anyhow. So now we can do, uh, Gabriel Kamen did this for his PhD thesis. We can now do what um, Logotita has done in a monkey. But the two differences, A, of course, it's a monkey versus a human, and you know you never know what goes on in a monkey. And B, in the monkey, you have to train for many, many, many months, half a year to a year, to do this experiment. And so you always have to worry, what, what, what's the effect of training? Well, these patients, you tell them for two minutes, you know, just like I told you, and, and they experience a the phenomena. OK, so here, uh, uh, here's a cell that happens. To, it's one of the cells I think I also showed in the first class that likes curly. So out of the 50, 49 or 48 different images we showed it, it only really responds strongly to curly, statistically, at the 1% level. So here, you showed in the right eye curly, left eye the patient sees nothing, the neuron response, this is sort of the average response, and the perception is curly, is nothing else. Now we flash on the grating, so this is flash suppression. So perceptually, this suppresses this, and what you'll see, and what the patient told us he saw is the grating, and the neuron with some delay, that's like a 100 millisecond delay, uh, st st stops responding. Here the opposite, is, uh, the opposite occurs. Nothing in the right eye, in the left eye the grating. The neuron doesn't fire. We leave the grating on, we add curly. Curly perceptually suppresses the grating, the person reports curly, and the neuron fires very strongly. So, um, let's just go to this here. So we show this for two different types of cells. Here are all the cells that are selected for categories, like the, the neon I showed you first that fires to you know, bush or to go up, uh, as far as we can tell, to any well-known person. Well, here are the, few, the smaller number of cells that respond very selectively, like just to Curly. Or we have one to Michael Jordan. We have another one to um, Paul McCarthy, the Beatle, or the Clinton, etc. The, the results are stronger here, but they're similar here. So this average, average, uh, average over all these neurons. So let's say the effect. Let's just do it for the Clinton cell and call the effective stimulus Clinton, and ineffective all the other stimuli that the cell doesn't respond to. So um, first of all, we let me see. Um, so here uh, is nothing. Then the effective stimulus comes on. Nothing in the other eye, and the neuron strongly fires to the effective stimulus, and the person says, I see the effective stimulus. And then we flash on the other stimulus, okay? The other stimulus is perceived, and the ineffective, the firing rate of the ineffective stimulus goes down. And here the opposite is the case. You don't put the effective stimulus on, you put some other, uh, some other non-effective stimulus on, let's say, uh, you know, a picture of somebody else, the neuron doesn't respond to it, the person sees that picture though, then you add your effective picture, the Bill Clinton picture, the person reports you see Bill Clinton and the cell fires very, very strongly. So again, you can do, um, you can do information theoretic analysis to show there's a very nice correlation um, that you can, in most cases, you can read out the behavior of the cell, the behavior of the person, what the person sees, what the person tells you he's seeing from the behavior of the single neuron. Yeah, and you can also ask the question, to what extent, so in this period here, only one image is present, right? This is the first stimulus when you only have a monocular stimulus on, so you only have one image on. Well, in this second period, you have both stimuli on. So you can ask, is there a difference between this period when, let's say, you have Clinton on and somebody else, but you're seeing Clinton, and this period when you're only seeing Clinton? Can you tell? So perceptually, it's the same case. In both cases, you see only Clinton. But here you have nothing in the other eye, and here you have something in the other eye. So you can ask the question, you're only, can you distinguish this distribution from this? And the short answer is you can't. They have the same delay, they have the same duration, and they have the same um, amplitude. Okay, so let's finish here. So, so, um, so here we only have a small number of neurons because these clinical um, 
you know, we are on a very uh, strong constraint here. We only have very little time to recall because the patient is only in the hospital for very little time. And of course, most of the time, the, the clinical concern, you know, they want to sleep, they want to eat, uh, you know, the relatives are there. So we have very little time compared to monkey. So we only have very few cells. But the cells respond very nicely. They're very similar to the monkey recording. Uh, Two-thirds of the cell follow the percept, and no, no cell ever uh, follows the, uh, the suppressed, perceptually suppressed stimuli. Of course, this is in a higher area. Before, the, the, um, the cells that Logotitis recorded from are all in part of the brain. It's the sort of the last purely visual stage of the brain. It's the ventral pathway, infratemporal cortex, the last purely visual stage. We are recording um, in this part of the brain called middle temporal lobe. We'll hear it next week. It's critically involved in, in, uh, in memory. It gets output from, the visual st uh, from this visual, but it also gets output from lots of other sensory areas. It's a multimodal area that responds to vision, as you can see, to visual input, but it also responds to other things, and it's key involved in transferring things from short to long term memory. Um, yeah, we'll talk it also in the, the, the movie. Um, uh, the, in the movie we're going to see in class, that also involves uh, um, memento, that also involves injury to, the, to this part of the brain, middle temporal lobe. Okay, so, so just to finish today's class, so we, we are introducing these perceptual stimuli. Perceptual stimuli allow you to dissociate the input from the percept, so you can separately manipulate the input, or, or you can manipulate the percept. And um, there's a very active area uh, doing this in humans and monkeys, also a lot of fMRI. And what, what the, the, the electrophysiology seems to show very clearly that in the early part of the brain, in, in LGN, I didn't mention that at all, there's no effect whatsoever of, of perception in LGN. And in V1, based on the single cell electrophysiology, there is uh, only a very weak effect. Now, there's an interesting um, discrepancy here. The number of papers that appeared in the human literature in f using fMRI, using functional magnetic resonance imaging, and there they do see a, a much stronger modulation in the early area V1 than in the electrophysiological. So in the electrophysiological literature, as I mentioned, you have millions of neurons that fire away in V1 and without having any influence on, on the percept, or the percept doesn't have any influence on the, on the neurons activity in primary visual cortex. There's a discrepancy in the functional literature. It seems that they find a different result that has to be resolved. But that in the, in the higher stages, it is uh, very clear in the higher stages, uh, infratemporal cortex and um, medial temporal lobe, the neurons, a significant fraction of neurons follow the percept. And there seem to be no neurons that, res that respond to the suppressed stimuli. And a subset of these neurons are probably going to be critically involved, not only correlating the, with the percept, but generating the percept. And so a big push now is towards try, try to understand where the neurons that are actively involved in generating and trying to find out techniques that can zoom into them and then manipulate their, their behavioral state so we can make the transition from correlation to causation. Okay. Next week, we'll talk about zombies.